Fall back, Shabbatah. Fall back, man. You might be having a long day. You might be having an early day. It might be, uh, you know, a laid back day. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it is for you, Shalawah, man. Appreciate y'all, man. I appreciate all the love, all the support, all the sponsors, man. Keeping the radio flowing, the ether going, man. All the ether squad dropping the drop. Everyone support, man, with wonderful comments. You know what I mean? I'm digging all, all your great comments, man. I, I can't wait to do a whole show just digging on your comments. And it's really uh, something that gives us a lot of validation when you dig on it. When you come with something, man, that we can all dig on, we do it together, man. And, uh, you know what I'm saying, AI, man, to everyone, man, that's just uh, downloading the app, man. You in the app, you know what I mean? You in the ether, you got the app. It's real easy to get in the ether, man. Again, we got over... I want to say over 20 radio shows, man, dropping. We got our schedule. It's flowing. You know what I mean? We got the Eat the Squad dropping. It. Right now, we in the drop city, man. I don't care where you go, Bojack, but I can't have you around here. Yeah, man. You make me too sad. <laughs> we in drop city, man. You got to get in the whip. You know, these are just some of the sounds you might hear just rolling through drop city, man. You never know. Get the app, click the link below. You download it from your uh, iTunes, Google Play, all that stuff, man. Go ahead and make it happen. That way you always got the drop, man. So, yeah, man, you see what we digging on, man? We digging on the seven tablets of creation, man. You know what I mean? Just connecting some of the Sumerian history, man. I, I think something might connect, man, especially when you're talking about Nazi of Mare, Summer, Sumer, Sumer set. We got to connect Sumer, man, which is going to help us a lot, man. We're going to dig on that. We're going to talk about the Irish legend of Regamon. But first, we're going to dig into this Nehemiah, and I got to give Ahab to the Templar, man. Go subscribe to Urban Reed. Get the drop. Because the Templar, you know what I'm saying, was just, you know, bringing up some great information that we have been digging on, man, you know, a while back, man, about the Nehemiah uh, Theodorus and how this connects. Is this the Nehemiah? Is the Nehemiah? That Daniel Lowe is talking about in the Forbidden Histories of America. All right. You go get that drop. Click, you know what I mean? Get that drop. You know what I mean? Hit up the drop library. Um, click the link below. You know what I mean? So, yeah, man. Is this Nehemiah here the same Nehemiah in the script? You know what I mean? Is this two completely different things? Separate timelines and all that. That's another thing we're going to dig on is chronology, the timeline. We're just going through an investigation. Maybe something fits. So, can we fit this Nehemiah with that Nehemiah? Especially we're talking about a Nehemiah and Forbidden Histories of America. We're about to get some of that. or Actually, we're about to get a link, you know, that's connecting some of that information. And, uh, you know, it seems like an Israelite on Israelite war going on. Remember, as the scripture says, after the days, after Solomon's death, the kingdom is divided. So we got now Judah on Judah, northern tribe, southern tribe. We got all this stuff popping off. So is this real evidence, man, right here with the copper color American right here, the indigenous, that there's war going on, that there's this history of this Solomon the Builder, like the book says, Forbidden Histories of America, in 775 A.D. Is it 775 A.D., who they call Solomon the Builder, all right, Sylvanus told Texas. We got to keep digging on this, man, because not enough people are digging on this particular recon, man. Because when you deal with the Toltecs, you're talking about Israel. When you deal, deal with the Kumsa, you're talking about Israel. These are priest kings, and you're digging up Israel right from beneath your feet, man. So we can look at these timelines, you know, 775. Uh, they got Sylvanus Toltecs, and now there's this Theodorus, Amari, Amari, like Amarika, Amari. Nehemiah Todros, all right, so all these names, but he's apparently a Theodore Rus. He might be a Rus, right? He's Ruses of Russia, Ruses. Now you got Russia, all these connect with the Clan Seal, Clan Ross, Clan Seal, Andreas. We're going to get more on that, man. Love the tie battle. We'll hit us with some great, a great link on that. Maybe we got time, you know, on the dismount because we're just talking to Ruses, man. So and it's exciting, man. I'm trying to get all this in. We're going to be all good, though. We also got a great clip talking about the, the chronology as well, the, the chronological shifts. So you got Anatoly Fomenko doing great research, putting together what he's calling the true chronology in Russia. He got three time shifts. 
that he's focusing on that apparently is, is, is a body bag that Scalager and Fatavius, you know, wh wherever you get your modern chronology right now, you got the Scalager, Scalager and Fatavius, and they literally just took our real history and just started dropping it off, dropping it off. So here's the real history going down around, you know, after 900s, they say after the 900s up to the 1200s, you got the meat. And they're taking that meat and they're dropping off that same history, but they're dropping it off 330 years. They got 333 years, something like that. They got 1178, I believe. Then they got, or, or something like that, 1100. And then they got like 1800 years. So you got 300 years, 1100 years, 1800 years. The same king, right? The same people, the same story. So that's why you find in Preston John in all these timelines. That's why you find it phantoms and duplicates and reflections and all these timelines but most of the history is popping off after the so-called 900s so you got this uh nehemiah theodorus war against sylvanus to texas who they also call solomon the builder all right so is this connecting to the biblical narrative right of solomon you know after his death the kingdom is divided now this is war popping off, but you know you know it's a family war because Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Theodorus, he takes the captives from the you know Solomon situation and he takes them back to Europe and he puts them under protection of the Rus family of his family so that they don't get jammed up by any of these real barbarians and situations. So you know they don't just start slaughtering the captives and put them in slavery. They put them in protection in Europe. So you got a lot of noble families here connected to the noble families in, you know, over there. Europe here, all the same families have been rocking. That's just Asia. We're connected to Asia. This is all Asia, all right? All, but this is the old world, is always saying. It's the old world, is always saying, man. So let's get with it, man. Let's get with it. You know what I mean? So... One key thing that's popping off, and first I'm going to get a little of this, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, Kalelus Theodoru, so you got a little backstory. Then we'll get into the script on the Nehemiah. You know, I got a few different versions to compare. And, uh, you know, but one quick thing, one quick thing. All right, so in the separate right. Well, I'll put it like this. When you look up Nehemiah, you go to Nehemiah, say, man, go to Nehemiah, you go to Nehemiah. You know, let's say you got your, let's say you got your uh, KJV, you know what I mean? This is the, this is the 1611 joint, all right? This is the one that got the Apocrypha in it, man. This is the one that got uh, the Maccabees, got all that joints, man, you know what I mean? So, Yeah, okay. So you go to Nehemiah in this joint. You know, it's going to start basically like it would start. You know, I just pulled it up over here in a blue letter Bible. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Kislu, Kislau, <laughs> in the 20th year, as it is in Shushan, the palace. So that's how it would start when you go to Nehemiah. You know, if I go here, yeah, yeah. all right. So basically, the same thing. You know, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter one, Nehemiah, he, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass. All right. So that's how it starts. Here, rung the bell that got me even digging further back when we talk Ezra, all right? Because you might already know this, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people might not, and it just kind of rung a bell for me. So you might be digging on this for the first time. Just You might have never read Nehemiah and might not know what I'm talking about. So typically, if you look in the you know, KJV or whatever the case is, it'll come up right after Ezra. So you'll be you know, kind of jumping into it like it's two separate things sometimes. But this is kind of helping connect that maybe it's all the same thing. 
because when you talk about Nehemiah and the Sephora, the Sephora, all right, it don't just start at Nehemiah where everybody else start. It goes back to Ezra. Au revoir. So, this is Nehemiah when you look at it from this translation here, which is really interesting, man, because you got the Sephir of Ezra, the Nehemiah, all right, also known as Ezra. How you know it ain't no play play is that when you go to the second book or second Ezra, also called Nehemiah, then it starts with the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass. And that's where everything else starts. And, you know, when you look it up in the KJV or you look it up in the Blue Letter Bible, Blue, Blue Letter Bible Classic. All right. So, I mean, that kind of, you know, was interesting to me. Something that, you know, I didn't catch fully. You know what I mean? When it comes to Nehemiah and again, love to the tent. And when you talk Nehemiah, at least that this is what we're getting here. You're talking Ezra's, man, because this is where, this is where it picks up in your normal Bible. When you go look for Ezra, for Nehemiah, it picks up in Ezra chapter two or, or the second book of Ezra. <laughs> Ezra Nehemiah. Keep that in mind. Just keep 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 this stuff in mind. All right, just keep this stuff in mind. And again, you know I mean, we got the stones. That stones edition right here. Stones to knock. So I'm just looking at different, you know, different joints here. And it's the same thing. Now, you got to go back to Ezra to get the story. And I'm actually going to go back to Ezra in a second. So, I'm going to keep this right here because I want to start here at Ezra 7, which we know is really Nehemiah 1, which your Nehemiah that you would think is Nehemiah 1, or the first book is really the second book of Nehemiah because it's really the second book of Ezra. All right? And not only that, But then it continues into Ezra 3, also called 1st Esdras. <laughs> so this is why it gets confusing. So that's why we got to talk about it. All right, so you might be over here. Now look, again, this is the 16, 11. All right, so this is before they took out what they call the, the these secret texts, the, the, these removed texts, these what they call the apocrypha. Now you can go, you know, if you just got the regular KJV, KJV, you know, get you a separate apocrypha. But the point is that this used to be already in here. This is in here. All right. So you know, in case you didn't know that. All right? Now. So yeah, we got the same thing here. Oh yeah, yeah, address. That's what I was on. I almost lost my train of thought. So here I got basically you got an Ezra one. All right, Ezra one <laughs> is Nehemiah one. All right, so just for the sake of this particular, you know, flow here, we just gonna call Ezra Nehemiah. All right, so Nehemiah is Ezra one. All right, Ezra 2 is where you pick up when you just go look for Ezra in your Bible. I mean, go go look for Nehemiah. That's really Ezra 2, but it's also Nehemiah or the second book of Nehemiah. That's the second book. Then it goes into Ezra 3 or Nehemiah 3, which is also called Ezdris. So Ezra is Ezdris is Nehemiah. But you see how you got a piece of it here, right? You got a piece of it here. 
You gotta get a piece of Nehemiah. But then you gotta go way over here. What's that address say? <laughs> so now you're in the Apocrypha in the 1611. Alright, now you're in Esdras. But it's the same Esdras. And again, it's the Apocrypha that's inside of the KJV 1611, man. Just letting you know that they're playing with you, if you didn't know already. Hold up, man. Let me get back in my Drop City vibration. You know what I mean? Okay. But that's the same Esdras as we see right here again. I'm just digging on it, man. Alright, so this would be Ezra 3. Alright, or Ez Ezra's, what they're saying, the first. The first book of Ezra, which is really Ezra 3 or Nehemiah 3. All right. All right. All right. Let go. Make sure we vibe in high. There we go. All right, man. So let's get to it, man. I'm going to get a quick link. On this uh, Kalelus Theodoru, so you can see where we're going with this, in case you didn't get the drop before. So pull up this link right here. We got all the links below. Pull this one up. It should look just like that. My alkaline. I'm gonna get you a copper vessel, man. You know what I mean? You're gonna feel the difference, man. Hey, you got this off Amazon. You know, a couple bucks, man. Ain't nothing, man, to go. You know, let this be relaxing for you, man. You know what I mean? Let you digging on this great, you know, you know, water that's coming in. All praise to Wah, man. Let it, let it, let it be. You know, what I'm saying, relaxing, man. Don't, don't let it be too mind heavy, man. And you know, tripping out. And man, we flowing, man. We taking off in the ether, man. We in Drop City, man. We in the vibe. Let's go. All right. So it says in the 1920s in Tucson, Arizona. Remember, we've been digging on those Tucson artifacts in this book right here. And we read this book every Tuesday night at 9 o'clock Pacific. 9 o'clock. Hold up. Tuesday. Yeah. 9 o'clock because we got Draconology at 8. Hey, Amen. You try to memorize our schedule. Let's go, man. <laughs> All right. So in the Tucson, Arizona, 1920s were found objects and writings in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and both. Catholic and Jewish ritual objects or Hebrew objects, all right? And symbol Cyclone Covey describes this discovery in his book Kalelus, a Roman Jewish colony in America at the time of Charlemagne through Alfred the Great. So this is where we heard of this book. I mean, and the author that was using this information, uh, David Lowe in Forbidden Histories of America, that's who took our videos down when we started dropping and connecting it to us. They said, nah, we want it to be Roman. We said, Roman is Ramon. Ramon is pomegranate. Pomegranate is a symbol of the promised land. So the Romani or the Romanians, <laughs> the original Romanians, the Ramones, you're just talking the original Romans, is the original people of the promised land, Kalelus, is us, is you. It's the copper colored naga found here. You the copper colored naga found here, man. Can you dig it? So we had to go get this hard copy. 
and see what they was talking about. And this is what we talking about. So, let's get it. So, Covey and other researchers are amazed at the mixture of Jewish, Hebrew, right? Christian and Kabbalic, Kabbalistic objects and symbols. They're just confused. However, this much fits the period in the 8th century when the Carolingian Empire, there is a Jewish principality in southern France called Septimania. There's a Hebrew connection. There's a Hebrew monarch. Septimania in France, all right? Remember the France are the Franks, and the Franks are part and parcel with the Rus. We're about to get into back. We're going to get back in the pigs, man. I've been saying that, but it has to be the right time, all right? Because when we get there, we're going to take off. I want everything. I want all the roads covered because we're going to take off. We ain't, we about to be in cruise control, man. We about to be in Drop City, man. Like I said, I hope you got the Drop City vibrations. I hope you got it up right now. So you can get in Drop City, man. Get in the whip. <laughs> so we're talking about a Carolingian Empire. There is a Hebrew principality. They say Jewish. I'm going to make it clear for you. In southern France, called Septimania, ruled by Theodoric of Narbonne. Now, this Theodoric of Narbonne, remember, we're about to get into the Anatoly for Maker chronology. They've added over over a thousand years to all native people on all native lands. Just know that they pushed your history back, so they created a big wall, like all this wall space right here, all this. Is what was created when they pushed your history back. Imagine this is your history, and it used to be over here, and they pushed it back. All right. When they did this, they did three shifts: 333 years, 1100 years, 1800 years. Now you're reading about King David in 700 BC. They done flipped it over 1800 years. You put it all the way back. You're back in this Kalelus. You're back in this. You know what I'm saying? Fountain of Youth, Preston John, you know, Genghis Khan invasion situation, middle age thing. And that's why that book cost $999, man. The medieval history of the Israelites. The, the medieval history of the Israelites by Robert Grisham. It cost $1,000. You look it up. Man, we had the people, man, behind the wall rocking on that one, man. They had that book. We had a whole little library, man. We were passing out books. You know what I'm saying? Okay, the homie get the book back. Okay, you next. You know what I'm saying? We had a Horace Butler, Ross Cryal, man, ba Babylon of Book 2. Hey, all these books, man. We, we even had Anatoly's book, History of Science Fiction, a big ass volume of it like this. We had uh the Gerald Massey book, Book of the Beginnings. We had all those books behind the wall, man. Love to my family behind the wall, cause we do it for you. You in our heart bone. We spiraled up for you. We ain't gonna forget you. We know you over there getting jammed up, man. So we love y'all. We do it for you, man. Hey, how right, let's go, man. So Septimania ruled by Theodoric of Narbonne. Back it up. However, this very much fits the period of the 8th century when in the Carolingian Empire, there is a Jewish principality, all right, in southern France called Septimania. Ruled by Theodore de Narbonne, Machir Tadros, Ben Judah. So, you know, enough said right there. He's the son of Judah. All right. We're talking about David, Davidic warriors, man. Davidic, David warriors. He's a son of David. He's a son of Judah. All right. Then it says Magnario, Amari, Amir. All right, born 17, died 765. Many members of this family descended from the Exilarchs, the Exilarchs, all right, so these Hebrew Exilarchs of Babylon, they were in Babylonian captivity. We're going to get back into Persia. We're going to talk a little to about Persia because Persia is a very kind of vague name too. It all comes from that Perusia, Perusia, Perusia. So there might be a Rus connecting into this Persia. 
which might be connecting even with Cyrus, which even the Most High gave Cyrus some love. We're going to get that. So let's go, man. Let's go. This is interesting, man. We just digging on it today, man. Thank y'all for coming. We chilling in Con Drops Corner, man. Go ahead and pull the seat up. Let go, man. Go ahead and take your shoe. You know what I'm saying? Put your fuzzy slippers on or something. Take a ride in Drop City. Ain't no reason learning can't feel like this. Ain't no reason getting back to you shouldn't feel like this, man. Shabbat up, man. AI, I love y'all all. Let go. So we got Theodore, who they also call Makir. Todros, remember, Makir is like Mark. It's the Mark, all right? The sign. The sign. The Mark is the sign. Let's go. Todros, Todrus, all right? Ben Judah, Magnario, Amari, Amor, Amer. Many families of many members of this family descended from the exilarchs of Babylon, embraced a Jewish form of Catholicism. No, they are Hebrew Israelites. All right, a Jewish form of Catholicism. Come on, man. Remember, Catholic, Catholic is Cathay. Cathay is Cateo. Cateo is right here on your maps, right here in the four corners, right here in North America. The real China, man. Love to the family, the light hour in the ether, dropping it, man. Every Monday night at 8 o'clock. Bang, I got it memorized, man. Monday night, 8 o'clock, man. Get that light hour, man. They're digging on the American discovery of Europe. And it's amazing, man. Love to the light hour, the pre light, the family. Let's go. All right. So they call it a Jewish form of Catholicism, while other members remain outward Orthodox Jews. All right. Now we're talking Kalelus artifacts in Tucson. Tucson, Arizona. The Kalelus records speak of Theodore Rus as the leader of many peoples who leave the Roman lands for Kalelus in 775 AD. Remember, Kalelus means promised land, specifically America. All right? Covey and others believe that Theodorus is a Jewish leader in the city of Rome. Remember Rome, Roma, Roma, Ramon, promised land. However, this is too literal reading of the term Rome. Theodorus is none other than the Jewish king of Septimania. Sept, seven, seven cities, cities of gold. All right, we're going to get it. So we're just talking cities of gold. We're just talking seven cities of gold. We're talking American history. We're talking 775 A.D., all right? <laughs> this is pre-all that stuff that we're talking about. This is that, all right? You're talking the promised land. You're talking Solomon. Are we also talking Nehemiah, Ezra? Let's go. I mean, surf the wave. Why not? We're just digging on it, seeing where the pieces of the puzzle fit. If it fits, cool. If it don't, cool. We know that. We could, you know, maybe... Put that to the side and come back to it. You know what I'm saying? This is just an investigation. Don't worry about being right. I ain't trying to, you know, prove to be no no guru. You know what I'm saying? This ain't no guru challenge. We just saying, hmm. Or Ruach is pushing us, you know, this this is coming from having having a great conversation with the Templar. So this is just, you know, I got all kind of other things I want to get to, but I said this is mighty fascinating. So let's get it. And then seven tablets of creation might tie right in as well. So we're talking, uh, okay, Theodorus, leader of many peoples, leaves the Roman lands for Kalelus in 775, all right? So they're calling him the king of Septimania, seven cities, seven, let's go. A Roman Jewish state in southern France. Remember the France are the Franks. Remember the indigenous people of France sued the government the French government for the indigenous title of French. <laughs> so that they're the real French. The indigenous Nagas, copper colored people, all right? The Indians, so called Indians, the indigenous people, sued to get the title French, because that's their title. So when we talk France, we still talking you. He is the son of the first Hebrew king of Septimania. Also called Theodoric, Theodoric, Thierry, Amary de Narbonne, Makir Tadro. So his father had the same name. All those names, all those titles. 
Now it says Theodorus, Dietrich, Theodore, Amari, Deteti, Nehemiah, Namon, Amar ben Amor, also known as Theodore, King of Saxony, and Namus, Duke of Bavaria. He and his brothers were great warrior Davidic princes of the time of Charlemagne. So he was a Davidic prince, a prince in the line of David. All this might be rocking at the same time. Man. They stretch time out, they push time back. We're just investigating it. It even seems like something might be flip flop. That's just because you only know history one way. And we're looking at history <laughs> with a dragonfly perspective. A dragonfly, if you if you missed all that drop, a dragonfly sees 360 degree panorama. It's the only, you know, species I know of that can see 360 degrees panorama. So even when it's flying away from you, it's still staring right in your face bone. You know what I'm saying? It's able to see the full portion. Some people go to their secret sciences. To get 33 degrees, we talking 360 degrees, full panorama, you know what I'm saying? So he and his brothers, remember, so this is Theodorus, Theodorus. So we say, is he a Rus? I don't know, it appears he's connected to the Russians. He takes the family back to Europe, puts them under Rus protection. It also appears that he's a son of David or... Of, of the line of David, he's been Judah, uh, you know, all these things, you know, you see all this right here, hope you can, hope you can pull it up and get the drop, I know it's small here, but pull it up so you can see it, all right? and all this is also in that uh, book, Forbidden Histories of America, so you can get it there, all right, uh, the last part is this, and then we're going to get some of this Nehemiah and little Ezra. So he and his brothers were great warrior Davidic princes of the time of Charlemagne. Professor Arthur Zuckerman in the book of Jewish Princedom in feudal France confuses him with his father who bears the same Frankish names. So these are the Franks. The Franks are also Israel. You dig? The Rus and the Franks are both part and parcel with starting the Knights Templar. The original Templar guarding the secrets of the Temple of Solomon. We're talking about Oak Island, right? X marks the spot, right? We gotta get back on Oak Island. All these treasures where they got the Templar symbols. And that's the towel that they rock, and that's the Wakanda forever, right? This is the towel. This is the last letter of the Hebrew, a left bet. This is the towel right here. This is the mark, this is the sign. We're talking Makir. We're talking Makir Theodorus. We're talking the Mark. This is what his name means. This is what his father's name means. So these are Hebrews over here. Hebrews over there. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom's divided. Now they're reclaiming certain portions of these Roman or Romani or these pomegranate promised lands in Kalelus. And it's all happening according to this narrative in 775 AD. So when Columbus came over here, with a Hebrew interpreter to speak to you looking for the Grand Khan or the Grand Priest. This priest is still in the line of these Nehemiah, Nehemiahs and these Theodoruses and this Solomon the Builders and all these priest kings that's already here. Who is Prester John? King David, already here. That's why he's searching for the Grand Khan. That's why Genghis Khan came to take the Khan in the 1200. Again, the most real history, man, is popping off at that time. And they're putting phantoms and duplicates way back to the BCs, having us tripping. We over here connecting to some phantom, connecting to a duplicate. Because it has a, a signature that's familiar. It has an ancient love song that we hear. But the real, original, the heartbeat is what we're searching for. That's why the investigation continues, my people. That's why we're digging on it, man. Hey, how to drop nation, because you got to drop a nation dealing on Digging on that healing, dude. Digging on that drop. You've been holding me down, man. From day one, right off the balcony, man. And I'm right here, still rocking because of that. 
because of my strong supporters, man, because of the wall of protection, man, the dragons on the wall is why, man, Con Drop is still here in your face, bone. Why the tribe is stronger than ever, man. Why the vision is stronger than ever. Hey, hi, man. All praise our creator. Allah, hawa. Dig on. So last part is this, man. Can we talk about this Nehemiah Theodore? And we're going to compare him with the Nehemiah or the Esdras or the Ezra. I mean, in the script. So it says, he and his father bore the same Frankish names of Theodoric Ameri. Now they spell it Mary, A-I-M-E-R-I. -E What's that got to do with America? We're talking America, right? Amar ben Amar. What came first? You know what I'm saying? What is it? Because he reconquered the lands of America. Now we have America. Is it named after it? You know what I mean? What's going on? He he, he did reconquer it. The land might be named after him. He did reconquer it. You know what I'm saying? So how far does this go back? On the death of his father, Machir Theodoric, Theodorus, in about 765 A.D., Nehemiah Theodoric, becomes the Western Exilarch and leader of all the Jews and revived Western Roman Empire of Charlemagne. I know that's a mouthful, but yeah, he became the man. He became the, the leader of all the Jews of the revived Western Romani, Ramon, Ramon, Pomegranate, all right? You know, we're just talking about him conquering, reconquering America for this particular, you know, tribe of Israel versus that particular. Remember, after Solomon's death, the kingdom is divided. Let's go. So it says in 775, Nehemiah Theodore reconquered the American Empire of Kalelus. The American Empire of Kalelus. And his name is Amari. Amari. <coughs> All right. Now it says Kalelus was ruled by Sylvanus Toltecs. This is where you get in the Toltecs. And these Toltecs are the Toltecs. All right. Who are Israel, Israelites. Because you've got a whole line of them. Including the line of Kitsukoto. Or Joshua. All this is connected. So now we can't just demonize kids of cold to when he's being connected directly to the Toltecs, directly to Israel. Right? Just like we said, Hawa Mag, Hawa Tha, Tekum Sa, Israel, Israel, Israel. Man, you dip, you digging on your breadcrumbs, man. So we're just putting it all together. You got to put the breadcrumbs, man, back together. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. You got to put Humpty Dumpty back together, man. Let's go. 775, Nehemiah Theodorus re reconquered, which means that he must have, his family must have had, you know what I'm saying, the drop in it before. He is a Davidic prince, so he feels like he's taking it back for his particular, you know what I'm saying, tribal things. You know what I'm saying? Let's go. Kalelus was ruled by Sylvanus to Texas. Solomon the Builder, Solomon the Builder, Solomon the Builder. So Totexas, we got last time, literally means Master Builder. A Totexas, literally, Toltec is a Master Builder by name. And you have Solomon the Builder, which is connected to David the Builder. Again, Game of Thrones has Bran the Builder who builds Westeros, so rebuilds West. He builds the wall. Man, hold up. Man, I wish I had that clip, man. All right, man. All right, go go dig on Game of Thrones because you got this wall, right? But the wall, they said, was built by Bran the Builder. Bran the Builder. And then they said he also built most of Westeros or West America, right? The Builder, Solomon the Builder, Bran the Builder. How's this connected, man? Let's go, man. Come on, man. Come on, you got the drop. 
So at that time, remember, in the days of Solomon, the kingdoms divided. Calalus was ruled by Solomon the Builder, Sylvanus told Texas, the hereditary ruler of this former Jewish ruled Roman colony, <laughs> Hebrew Israelites in America, man. Amaru Khans, all right. Calalus was founded in the first century BC by the Babylonian exilarch known as Sylvanus Ogam or Sylvanus Bravo, Solomon II, Babylonian exilarch. Nasi of Mara, ruler of Sumer, Sumer set in Britain. So Sumer, Sumer set, we're going to dig on the seven tablets of creation. You know, he's going to introduce you to the water. A great Roman Jewish ruler, Hebrew ruler, let's go. Soldier and ancestor of the Swan Knights. He also had a fleet of trading vessels known as the ships of Solomon. The swan boats, the ships are shaped like a swan, with its sails like the wings of a beautiful gliding white swan. After the defeat of Sylvanus to Texas, the members of the royal family, the Nagas, the Negroes, the Toltecs, all right? So you got a portion of these Toltecs, the members of the royal family were sent back to Europe. All right, where they were under the protection of Nehemiah. All right, so Nehemiah Theodorus and his family protected the royal family under Solomon the Builder. They didn't slay them up. They didn't hang them. They didn't slaughter. You know what I mean? They protected them with the family, with the Rus, all right, in Europe. So this lets you know this is a family war going down. And, you know, something that the Most High proclaimed after the death of Solomon, the kingdom would be divided. So this is a blessed situation, the same way as uh, uh, Cyrus. We're going to dig on some of this Cyrus tribe with Nehemiah. Let's get this part quickly. The legends of Dune and Ogier ordained no gear, all right, are based on the activities of his family descended from Duan or Antagon, Antagon or gear, and Sylvanus Bravo, Solomon Barber or Berber, all right, the legends of Ogier the Dane, son of Godfrey Kadrod, and Dune of Mayence actually refer to Tawatha de Danan or Dunan, who are also known as Mananan, or Maine of America. Can't make this stuff up, man. You see it here, man. Go ahead and pause it, read it, do what you got to do. But pull it up so you can see it yourself, man. All right, so that's when last time we got into the Rhode Island, the Rhoda situation. But we got Maine of America. It's also man and man. All right. Keep this, you know, just keep it in mind because we might get back to this main real soon, especially when we get into this regama. all right? So you got Maine of America where the giant ogre heads of the Almec are found. So we got an Almec connection. <laughs> back to this Toltec connection. The legends of the Ogier, the Dane. The Ogier is the ogre. The whole Shrek situation is the Ogier or the Almec. Right? It says the giant Ogier heads of the Almec. The giant Ogier heads of the Almec are found. So when you see the giant Almec heads, they make fun of them in Shrek and make it an Ogre. But they're just talking about you as usual. You are the Ogre. You're the Almec which is the Toltec, which is the, you know, tribes connected to Sylvanus, Toltecs, and Theodorus, because it's all a family affair. Same tribes, infighting, let's go. So again, the legend of Ogier the Dane and Dune, of My Dune de Mayence actually refer to Tuatha de Danin. You got, a lot, you, got, you, you got a lot of white people making, you know, Tuatha videos, like there's some angelic white race. No, we're just still talking the same Almecs, we still talking the same Nagas, the same Aztecs, the same Toltecs, the same copper colored American found here by the European in the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary.
definition of American. All right. So it says, the last thing we're going to get is right here on this. So Tawatha de Danan, who are also known as Mananan or Maine. So the, the state Maine today is named after Mananan or Dananan or the Tuatha de Danan, which is probably rocking in that area. It says where the giant ogre heads of the Almec are found. Right here in America, you know what the Almec heads look like. Then it says the Irish legend of Regamon also allude to this family. So, <laughs> when you talk about the Irish, the Scottish, again, you're talking about the Rus. All right, they say it's a Scottish tribe, but we already know Scottish is Princess Scotia. Scotia is the daughter of a Hebrew pharaoh. The daughter of a Hebrew pharaoh is Princess Scotia. All right, and Scotia becomes this Scotland, and these are Hebrews, man. These are Hebrew Israelites. This is all the same family under different titles, different names, dropped off in different places in the timeline. And it says the Irish legend of Regamon. The Irish legend of Regamon also alludes to this family. And uh, let's see. Let's get this Nehemiah drop and then we're going to get some Regamon drop. We're going to get some, yeah, we're going to get some Regamon drop. We're just, we just taking a trip through Drop City. All right. Just, you know, I'm going to read a couple of lines in Nehemiah, but I'm not going to start where it starts. You know, when you just pull it up, you know, this is where you, this is what you see when you pull up. But this is really Nehemiah, the, the second book, you know what I'm saying? I want to start in the first book. Just myself. I want to start in the first book, man. All right, so uh, you're gonna have to start back in uh, Ezra if you're in your KJV. Now let's dig on a couple things. It says now in the first year of Koresh, king of Persia. We're going to talk about the word Persia, all right, because it's not what you think it is. Oh, it's over there. Persia is, is, a, is a very vague term. All right, let's go. That the word of Hawa by the mouth of Jeremiah, Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Hawa stirred up the Ruach. Hawah stirred up the Ruah of Koresh, king of Persia. So king of Persia is Cyrus. And we're going to talk about some Cyrus in a minute. All right. So the Ruach of Cyrus was stirred up. Now he's the king of Persia. And if you already know the story, you know that Hawah used Cyrus in powerful ways. But we're just putting all this together with, these, with this Nehemiah Theodorus. So as I'm reading this Ezra Nehemiah, all right, that's what it says. We're comparing this Nehemiah with this other Nehemiah, or it could be the same Nehemiah that's actually taking place in 775 AD. So it's adjusting your timeline quite a bit. And we're going to get into the timelines and why, why we dare to do so. You know what I'm saying? Because they've dared to, you know, completely push our history all the way back. And we're pushing it back on their ass. You know what I'm saying? Saying, hold up, man. So this is actually taking place in recent times, man. I mean, you got King David, you got Nehemiah, you got Joshua, all this stuff popping up. Your Mashiach's all popping up, I mean, in recent history. So you know that you're connected to recent history, not some super far back B.C. situation. And that's part of the spell. Once you get over there, fake B.C.s and fake A.D.s, the Scaliger, Batavius, Hijack, then it starts to open up, your Ruach starts to move. Just like the king of Koresh here, or Koresh, the king of Persia, who was also Cyrus the Great, right? He has many names, this Cyrus. Let's go. So in the first year of Koresh, king of Persia, that the word of Hawa by the mouth of Yeramau 
might be fulfilled. Hawa stirred up the Ruach of Koresh or Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Koresh, king of Persia, Hawa of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. To build him a house in at Jerusalem. All right, so we're talking about you know conquering lands, come you know, saying you know rebuilding Jerusalem or building a house for Hawa in Jerusalem. Now where is that? Because right now we're just talking the forbidden histories of America. Let's keep it on mind. Which is in Utah, or are we just talk in Utah? <laughs> what do we talk? Who is there among you of all his people? His Elohim be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of Hawa of Israel, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever remains in any place where he sojourns, let the men of his place. Help him with his silver, with his gold, with his goods, with his with beasts, and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of Hawa that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief fathers of Yehuda and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, and all them rose, all them whose ruach Hawa had raised to go up to build the house of Hawa, which is in Jerusalem, and all they that were about them strengthened their hand and vessels of silver with gold with goods and beasts and with beasts was the beast probably with they dragons you know what I'm saying and with precious things beside all that was willingly offered also Koresh the king brought forth the vessels of the house of Hawa which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem and put them in the house of his Elohim even those did Koresh, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Mithrada, the treasurer, and numbered them unto Sheshbatazar, and the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, 30 charges of gold, a thousand charges of silver. All right, let's go right here. All right, so chapter 2. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon. So again, these are Babylonian exilarchs. Babylonian exilarchs. All right, so you got Ezra or Nehemiah. We're talking about, you know, a little backstory here with this Cyrus situation, Persia, but they're in Babylonian captivity. Again, what did it say in this link right here? says Nehemiah or Ezra becomes the western exilar or the leader of the Hebrews or the leader of the tribes or the priest king or the grand Khan in a sense and leader of all the Jews or Hebrews of the revived Romani right Roman Empire of Charlemagne and Charlemagne also called himself David he also called himself King David which is interesting as well so we're all just talking these Hebrew tribes, man. So let's go. All right, so it starts numbering all the people. We're going to pick it up right here in chapter 3 of Ezra. And then we're going to go to the second book of Ezra or, you know, Nehemiah in the regular, you know, modern scriptures you know it'll be the first book so then we're gonna go there and just see if we can pull anything out and you know i want you to continue this investigation you know is this the same babylonian exilar for exilar in babylonian times as this nehemiah that's happening in seven you know 65 you know what i'm saying so here we got a uh, chapter three and when the seventh month was come and the children of israel were in the cities the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. 
Then stood up Yahusha, the son of Yahu Zadok, and his brethren, the priests, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheol al is his names, man. She al <laughs> and his and his brethren, and built the altar of the Elohim of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, and as it is written in the Torah of Moshe, the man of Hawa. And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. What people? We're talking giants again. We're going to get back on those giants. And they offered burnt offerings thereunto Hawa, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the feast of Kokot, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required, and afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and also the set feast of Hawa that were consecrated, and everyone that willingly offered a free will offering unto Hawa for the first day and seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto Hawa, but the foundation of the temple of Hawa was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters and meat and drink and oil unto their Zion, Zidon, and to them of Zor to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Yafo according to the grant that had that they had of Koresh, king of Persia. In the second year of the coming of the house of Elohim of Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, son of she Atiel, and Yahusha, the son of Yot Zadak, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of captivity of Jerusalem, and appointed the Leviim, the Levites, from twenty years old and upward to set forth the work of the house of Hawa. Then stood Yeshua with his sons and his brethren. Alright, so we got this Yeshua popping off. You know what I'm saying? We got this Joshua over here. Alright, you know. All I know is we got another Joshua. <laughs> Alright, let's go. And all I know is that, you know, we know that a lot of this stuff has been, you know, taken out of the current KJV. So, you know, a lot of stuff has been taken out for a reason. So then stood Joshua, I mean, Ezra 3, verse 9. Then stood Joshua with his sons and his brethren, Quad Miel, and his sons, the sons of Yehuda, together to set forward the workmen in the house of Hawa, the sons of Kenadad, with their sons and their brethren to Levrim, the Levites. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of Hawa, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Akaf, with cymbals to praise Hawa after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. So they had everything in order. They had their priesthood, they're rebuilding the temple, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're getting their Ruach directly, you know, connected and communicated by the Creator directly so you know this is where they, all their burnt offerings and stuff and their tabernacle and their temple all this is being firmly you know relayed at this point you know what i'm saying so it was no guesswork you know what i mean so this just make it clear that when we do it when it's real it's real it's no guesswork to it this is verse uh let's go to chapter four now when the adversaries of yahuda and benjamin heard that the children of captivity, the captivity built the temple with Hawa of Israel, unto Hawa of Israel. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your, your Elohim as you do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ekar Kadan, king of Ashur, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua, and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto him, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our Elohim. We have ourselves together. We ourselves together will build unto our Hawa of Israel, as King Koresh, the king of Persia, has commanded us. 
So that's Cyrus who commanded them, who, whose Ruach was personally stirred up to build this house to the Creator, all right? And hire counselors against them to frustrate their purposes all the days of Koresh, king of Persia, unto the reign of Dar Yavesh, king of Persia, and in the reign of Akash Verosh, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Yehuda and Jerusalem. Now let's get it from here. You know, we just start from the way in this Nehemiah. I just want to pick it up because we're about to go into the second book. skip over too much because you know it's a lot of drop man just go dig on it yourself man because you know once you you know you're gonna have a bunch of trails you can follow man that might lead you directly back you know in the so-called modern history the so-called modern situation man so you know all right, all right you know i'm just gonna I'm just gonna go right here verse 10 now when ezra had prayed and when he had confessed weeping and casting himself before the house of a while there assembled unto him out of Israel, a very great assembly of men, women, and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shachan Yahu, the son of Yekiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, or Nehemiah, We have transgressed unto our Hawa, and have taken strange women of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our Hawah to put away all the women as and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of Adonai, and those of that tremble of the commandment of our Hawah, and let it be done according to the Torah. Arise, for this matter belongs to you. We also will be with you. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all of Israel, to swear that they should do according to this word. And they swore. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of Hawa and went into the chamber of Yukakanah, Yukakanan, the son of Elisha. And he, and when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made proclamation throughout Yahuda, Judah, and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity, that they should gather themselves unto Jerusalem, and that whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all the substance should be forfeited, and himself separated from the assembly of those that had been carried away. Then all the men of Yehuda and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the twentieth day of the month, and all the people sat in the streets of the house of Elohim, trembling because of the matter, and for this, and for the great rain. And Ezra stood, Ezra the priest stood up, and he said unto them, You have transgressed, and have taken strange women, to increase the transgression of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto Hawah of your fathers, and do its pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land, and from the strange women. Then also the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, As you have said, so must we do. But the people are many, and it is a time of much rain, and we are not able to stand without. Neither is this work of one day or two, for we are many that have transgressed in this thing. Let now our rulers of all the assembly stand, and let all them which have taken strange women in our cities come at appointed times, and with them the elders of every city and the judges thereof unto the fierce fierce wrath of our Elohim for this matter be turned from us. Only Yohanatan, the son of Ashiel, and Yekzeah, the son of Tikvah, were employed about this matter, and Moshulam and Shabbatai, the Levites, helped them, and the children of the captivity did so. 
and Ezra the priest with certain chief of the fathers after the house of their fathers. And all them by their names were separated and sat down in the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange women by the first day of the first month. And among the sons of the priests, they were found that they had taken strange women, namely of the sons of Yahusha, the sons of Yahuzada and his brethren, Meah, Masayahu, and Eleazar, and Yarif, and Gadah, Yahu, and they gave their hand that they would put away their women, and being guilty, they offered a ram of the flock of the transgression, and the sons of Emer, Kanan, Kanani, and Zavayahu, and all the sons of Karim, Misayahu, and Eliyahu, and Shamayahu, and Yet Yil, and Yuzi Yahu, and all the sons of Pashkur. All right, so all the sons came up. So, man, there's a long list right here. And again, when they talk strange women, you know, their main issue was going after foreign gods and false gods and whatnot like that. So, you know, now you had this issue in the camp. You had all these strange altars popping up. You had all these strange sacrifices popping up. All right, then he gets into, you know, the Nehemiah that pops up that, you know, you find when you look for Nehemiah which is really Ezra 2 right here, known as Ezra 2, also called Nehemiah. All right? So the words of Nehemiah, the son of Kal, Kaliah, the set, as it came to pass in the month of Kikliv, Kikliv, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Kanai, one of my brothers, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Yahudim, that had escaped the Judai, right, which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left are left of the captivity there, there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days and fasted, prayed before Hawa of heavens, and said, I beseech you, Hawa of heavens, the great and terrible Hawa, the guards that guards the covenant and shows mercy for them that love him and guard his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against you, and have not guarded the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which you command your servant, Moshe. Remember, I beseech you the word that you commanded your servant, Moshe, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me, and guard my commandments and do them, though there, though there were of you cast out unto the utmost parts of the heavens, yet will I gather them from thence and bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. And automatically it starts to connect with this Solomon the Builder Theodoru story. You know, what was their purpose in coming? back to what they say recapture the holy lands to to recapture the Kalelus, the promised land to recapture america you know what i'm saying was it to you know as he says right here you know yet will i gather them from thence and bring them unto the place that i have chosen to set my name there was he just bringing his people you know to a place that hawaii has put his name you know what i'm saying what was the you know, what was the Ruach, you know what I'm saying? How was the Ruach being fulfilled? And the same thing when we talk about Cyrus. Because even in, uh, we got Isaiah 45, right quick. All right, we got some more about this uh, Koresh king. It says, thus, says Hawa, 
to his anointed to Koresh. All right. We know that Koresh is Cyrus, whose right hand I have holding to subdue nations before him, that I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut, and I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break the pieces, the gates of brass, break the pieces of the gates of brass, and cut and sunder the bars of iron. All right, break them all down. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, Hawa, which call you by your name, am the Elohim of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have surnamed you that you have, though you have not known me, I am Hawa, and there is none else. There is no Elohim beside me. All right, so back it up. Who's he talking to? Thus says Hawa to his anointed, to Cyrus, to Koresh. Cyrus, who? The king of Persia? Hawa used the king of Persia? Hawa, you know what I'm saying, moved the Ruach of the king of Persia, man? That's Isaiah 45. So we're just getting it right back right here in the... Uh, the second book of Ezra or Nehemiah, all right? But if you turn unto me and guard my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out into the utmost parts of the heavens, yet will I gather them from thence and bring them into the place I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hands, O Adonai. I beseech you, let now your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and prosper. I pray you, your servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Alright, so we got a couple things to think about. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're putting this together. We know that over here, you know what I'm saying, in 775, we got this Nehemiah who becomes the Western Exilarch. You know what I'm saying? The the uh, the leader of all these Hebrews in this Western Roman Empire. Right? We got the Roman is the pomegranate connected to the Promised Lands, which is the Kalelus, which connects to these, uh, you know, Septimania, King of Septimania. And that's why I got Septimania right now over North America on my map. It just says Septimania right on top of North America. Sept, seven, seven cities, all right? Disconnected to, you know what I'm saying, this Cyrus and this situation, this Babylonian exilarch that we're reading right here, you know what I'm saying, who at this point right here is under King Cyrus, but read the rest of the story, you know what I'm saying, what happens with Nehemiah. So... You know, we got a lot to catch up, but, you know, I'm leading you there so you can keep investigating because we do this together because we got a lot to talk about, man. So that's just a little intro on this Nehemiah. I want to go into history now and get a quick clip on this from Manko. And then we're going to get back a little bit on this Cyrus and, uh, you know, keep it going, man, all the way into the seven tablets of creation and uh, do a little Regamon dismount, man. So we're going to cover a lot in a little bit of time. A hop to the home team. We just getting started. We got a lot of drop coming up, so get your rain boots. Get your rain boots, man. Let's get cozy, man. Let's see if we can get cozy. Let's get cozy. Let's get cozy. Oh man, hold up, man. All right. Okay. All right. All right. I got you. I got you. Don't trip. Don't trip. All right. How's that? We good? We good? All right. Told y'all, man, we getting cozy around here. Might be right there. All right. You know, again, the drop chatter, man. There's always that drop to be collected in the drop, drop chatter. Chat to chat, chatter. Hold on, hold on. Make sure y'all straight. Okay. Then we good right there, man. Oh, okay. We good? All right, cool, cool. 
get in the drop chat and get the drop. You know, I'm always dropping links in there. Somebody's always in there dropping link. Hiram Art just left, man. What it do, Hakan? Yo, Scepter Real, what it do, Templar? All right, all right. Let's get a piece of this. Get the link below. You can click on it. We're talking Anatoly Fomenko. New chronology. We're putting the chronology back together. Let's get a few minutes of this, man. Allah, wow. Get it like it's the first time. Let's go. So these examples we have shown clear, clearly demonstrate how mixed up mankind's history is. The chronology of the story is not just broken up in a few places, but requires a complete and thorough review. Go. How can we see all the contradictions all right, of the contradictions of the standard versions of history? Perhaps we should make a map of all the traditional chronicles, okay? first glance it seems impossible but nevertheless the task was doable these are investigators digging on the timeline so can we push the timeline to where this Nehemiah and that Nehemiah come together a goal Global chronological map. All right, since Anatoly Fomenko decided to find out how the world really looks as a story, to this end, he achieved a tremendous feat. He studied hundreds of ancient texts, tables, records, books, reviewed the ancient and medieval history of Europe, Egypt, Middle East, and the Mediterranean, so he wasn't on that play play. He studied most of the documents which describe my busy, which describe the major events of human history which allegedly occurred over the course of six thousand years from four thousand BC to two thousand AD. And we're gonna talk about the seven tablets of creation. Let's go. Play, play. To provide all this information visually, Anatoly for the man gold made a document for which there had been no precedent. He worked on it for six years. reading this for y'all man i know y'all might be at work or doing something man driving so i got you man all the information collected he depicted on a large chronological scale elongated along the horizontal time axis
consisted of the precise dates on which the founders of our traditional version of history insisted, Scaliger and Batavius. First the maps were drawn on graph paper, then the scanned images were transferred to a specific material. This unique method affects its size. The length of the map is 19 meters, and it was the first to ge geographically depict the history that is taught in schools and universities. So this is a stretched out version of history. Let's go. That's fundamental right there. It says this map contained tens of thousands of names, several thousand dates, information, and about a disturbance, the main books of the original sources. Chronicles of their dating, the author's chronicle, the author, occurrences in astronomy, and so on. Then this material was evaluated using the techniques developed by me and my colleagues. Noted on this map where there were duplicates, that is, periods that were shown to be similar by these methods. Duplicates, phantoms, reflections. How was this done? Anatoly Fomenko divided the history of the world at certain points, then every era's detail was displayed on the time axis. Periods which had similarities were moved to be simultaneous on the time axis, so they started adjusting all the phantoms and duplicates. To show how much overlap there is in, in the traditional chronology of historical events, for Manco assigned each time interval a letter. For example, the era of the Second Roman Empire was marked by the letter K. The same letter was used to mark as duplicates for the Manco had discovered. Other historical periods as well as their duplicates were identified by other letters, for example, C and P were also marked on the map. Is it play play? So a structure emerges that shows both this time axis and repetitions, repetitions of historical events. This is what we're digging on in our so-called Scaliger Batavius history today that's being taught in public school, indoctrination. They're just giving you repetitions of historical events, pushing them back in the past so that you don't connect to your real spiel. This map was named Global Chronological Map. It 
shows what should be the true chronology of historical events. It became apparent that in the traditional chronology there are three major time shifts. Three major time shifts, my people. This is what we've been getting on. So they, they pushed your history back three, three times at least. Major time shifts. There's others, but there's three major time shifts. By approximately 300 years, 1,000 years, and 1,800 years, like we said. So don't tell me that this Nehemiah in the Bible can't be the same Nehemiah we're reading about in 775 A.D. Not when you know for a fact that they pushed your timeline back at least a thousand years. So this biblical Daniel and there, Nehemiah, all this situation, they can say, oh, that's 600 B.C., uh, whatever, man. Not when you push our time back 1,800 years. So when I put it back, where does it land? Does it land around 900, 1100, 700? We're talking recent history. This is recent history. Three major time shifts. 300 years, 1,000 years, 1,800 years. Lots of real historical events of the Middle Ages were copied, right? Middle Ages, 1100s, 1200s, they were copied on paper by medieval chroniclers and sent into the past. They took it from the 1200s, sent it in the past. 1053, sent it into the past. 1800 years sometimes, 1000 years sometimes. How could this happen if the chroniclers of the Middle Ages made if the chroniclers of the Middle Ages made unintentional mistakes, was it play play? Was it on accident? Was it unintentional? Or was it Hijack City? You tell me. Hijack 101, you tell me. Let go. So take the four ancient chronicles, all right? They all describe the same events that occurred, for example, in Europe in the 1400s. Take the four ancient chronicles. We're about to talk about the seven tablets of creation. We're going to talk about ancient chronicles. And although they seem like it's super far in the past, just know that they shifted time back. And what you're reading might not be that long ago. 1400s, 1400s, Papu Boo, Genghis Khan, Preston John, what are we talking about? The invasion of you in America is the takedown of Jerusalem that you're reading about in 70 AD, people. This Titus Vespasian, you know what I'm saying? This is the takedown. This is the takedown. You got Hawashua, Joshua. All them already rocking here. King David, Preston John, already here. The takedown just happened. And you're reading about some history from 70 AD, Titus Vespasian, JC over there. It just happened here, man. You're reading about the American Holocaust, man. You, you were sacrificed. But the authors of these chroniclers, chronicles were living not only in different countries, but even at different times, they spoke and wrote different languages and used a different calendar, man. This is very important, my people. Wakey, wakey. Put it together. Put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Put yourself back together. Not surprisingly, in telling the same king so even though they're in different parts of the world or different locations or different shifts of the timeline, they're telling about the same king who was Prester John. City or battle, they gave them totally different names. They gave them totally different names. So you can read about Theodorus, who's also Amari, who's also Nahum, who's also Makir, 
who's also Nehemiah, they gave him totally different names. I mean, love to type battle. Man, she sent a great document we got to dig on. Talking about Marco Polo and also documents that call him Marco Paul. <laughs> and you got to say, you know, hey, you got to investigate. Is Marco Polo the Paul of the New Testament? I mean, we're just going to tie back in these areas. Peace of families. I mean, is Josephus Paul? I mean, there's a lot that you could tie in when you start to really dig on the right questions, man. They gave them totally different names. Same king, city, battle. They changed the battle. They changed the names, but they're talking about the same king, same battle. Therefore, when chroniclers in the 15, 1600s read these records, they decided that they were talking about four different errors. Nah, man, they put them in four different errors, man. The whole history is an error, man. Errors got to do with error. They've been making errors the whole time. And instead of putting these accounts simultaneously on the same time axis, they arranged them in sequence that is one after another. Look what they did to your history, people. So this will be your real history, let's say. They left one chronicle in the 1400s, so the real joint might be right here in the 1400s. You got invaded in the 1400s, right? Okay. A second, they pushed back 300 years, but it's the same story, same history, but they changed the name. They put different names, different names of the king, different names of the place, but you're reading about the same thing. Look what they did. They dropped you off, man. Who got the drop? Who got dropped off 300 years back? And then what? Same king, same battle, same battle, same invasion. Dropped off again a thousand years back. And again? Dropped off again 1800 years back. Put them all together and you get a very long history, man. Body bag, Daniel. When was the book of Daniel wrote? What time are we reading about the Babylonian eggs at large? Only with the help of mathematical statistics can we have a truly objective analysis of old texts. Without them, unfortunately, it is impossible to construct a chronology, man. We just digging on some Anatoly. And there's a lot more when you talk about the Anatoly, man. You know what I mean? We good, okay, we good, man. We're gonna have a great dismount. We're gonna talk about these tablets. But you know, let's just go through a couple things, man. So you got Anatoly for Mako, right? Anatoly for Mako. And these are just some, you know, little kind of quick bullet points, man, that we've been talking about when you dig on the real true chronology. But let's get it from here. Alright, so it says let us briefly re briefly remind the readers of the research. Results related in uh, chronology four book. Uh, according to our hypothesis, the horde, right? The horde or the order, horde is order, of the army or the army that had been any foreign force that invaded, had not been any foreign force that invaded Russia from abroad, but rather the regular Russian army. So who they're calling a foreign force or Mongols invading Russia were really just the Russians themselves that were already there. They just wanted to try to separate it and seem like, oh, look, you know, here's some savages that invaded, and those are the Mongols. No, the Mongols are the Russians, are the Russians, but they couldn't tell you who the real Mongols were, so they tried to make a whole nother image of the Russian. So they had to be like, oh, this invasion happened, and that's why we have all this stuff here. Nah, man, that's why you destroyed all the frescoes, all the Russian paintings, the frescoes of the dark copper color Hebrews that that are the Rus of Russia, that are the Rus like the Theodore Rus possibly like even the Cyrus, Cyrus, we're gonna get about this Cyrus, we're gonna talk about this Cyrus, Cyrus, man but rather the regular Russian army, so it says the Tartar 
We talk about Tartaria, right? We talk about the Negro, man. The Tartar and Mongol yoke was merely a period of military rule of Russia, which has never been conquered by any foreign force. The supreme ruler was the military leader known as the Khan or the Tsar, like Caesar. The Khan is the supreme ruler. Columbus came to America looking for the Grand Khan. The supreme ruler, the Hebrew Exilar. Whereas the civilian rulers or the princes were in the city's charge of provinces. Right. The ancient Rus Russians right, can therefore be regarded as a unified state. The great Mongol Empire is the Russians. <laughs> the Russians are the great Mongol. All right. Now let's see what this means. What does Mongol mean? Which had a very regular army of professional warriors, the horde or the order. Let's go. Let's pick it up right here. In the present book, we often use the words Mongolia or Mongols, inevitably confusing the readers despite our intention. The problem is that these words are already used in altogether different meaning, referring to different racial types known as mongoloid. However, our research demonstrates that the medieval meaning of the word had differed from the modern completely Mongolia or Tartar Mongolia. Tartary was the name of the medieval Russian Empire, which we also call Horde Russia or the Order, the Russian Order, or Clan Seol Andreas or Clan Ross. It is similar to the term Russian Empire or Soviet Union or Russian Federation. Who is it talk about the word Mongol? Here it says the Church Slavonic had had the official language of the Great Equals Mongolian Empire. So when you talk Mongol, you're just talking Great. All right, so the real Mongol are the greats or the great ones. Then it goes into the, the Kuban, the Cuban, right? The Cossacks, the Cuban, Cuba, Cuba. All right, we're going to skip that for now. We will be going back into that. The identity of Persia, like I said, you're just talking more of a vague situation when you talk Persia. On the military map of Peter the Great, dated 1702, we see the legend Moscow, we powers, Moscow, Moscow, Moses, Moscow, Moses, Moscow, let's go. Next to the land of Moscovia, this is all Moshe. Therefore, pars must be the synonym for the word land, resembling the word Persia. So Persia is only <laughs> referring to the word land. The implication is the word Persia, as used by many of the ancient medieval and even late medieval cartographers did not necessarily concur with the modern geographical location of Persia. So when we talk about Babylon, Babylonia, or Persia, stop trying to just be in the Middle East somewhere. Because we're not talking about the modern geographical location of Persia. We see that the word could simply be used as a synonym of land or country. So Persia just means land or country wherever it is being referred to due to the emergence of great many countries or fragments of the former Mongolian Empire in the epoch of the 16th to 17th centuries. Many Persians appeared on the map. Persians appeared on the map of the epoch. We have already seen the name Persia was used for Perusia, Perusia, Persia, Perusia, or Berusia, White Russia, France, Turkey, Iran, all right? So this is very interesting, man. You just got a vague term for land or country. And you also had this connection with Russia or Perusia. So this Russia situation could literally be Persia. So when we had this Babylon and this Babylonian uh, Exilar, you know, situation with Theodorus. And he took his people back to Europe, back to the Russia, back to Babylon, right? You know what I'm saying? How does this connect back with Cyrus? And all you're talking about is Russia, not the Middle East the whole time. So, you know, there's a lot of drop going into this, man. 
A lot of drop going into this drop, man. <laughs> oh, man, I can keep going with this stuff. Man, I can keep going. But for now, all right, let's go. Oh, oh, that's what I want. Okay, let's get this right here. This little part I was gonna get. I'm trying to see. Oh, Andrew. Yeah, let's talk about this Andrew right quick. So we're talking about Russia or Perugia or Persia. And then he had this other, you know, situation, another reflection, duplicate situation. All right. Let us remind that the Emperor Andronicus Christ. So you have this Christ popping up in 1152. They date the birth of the Mashiach to I think 1054, 1154. So that's all in his, you know, volumes. 1154 let's say now you have this other Mashiach at the same time 1152 also called Russian Prince Andrei Baba Lubisky something like that <laughs> then you got the Apostle Andrew the first so what's it got to do with Saint Andrew it's got to do with Saint Andrew right was crucified in 1185 so you got this Christ or Andronicus Christ or Apostle Andrew or Saint Andrew, let's go, being crucified in 1185. And this is all connected with these Russians. And all this is connected, man, I mean, with this whole Moscow situation, with this whole Kremlin situation, Slavs, all this has to do with Hebrew history. When? Different places, different times, same battles, and we're looking through the phantoms and the duplicates. You have Andrew the Apostle here or Saint Andrew. Here they give the date 62, died 62 AD, all right? Or was he crucified in 1152, all right? So, yeah, that, that's a difference between a little over a thousand years, something like that. And remember them, <laughs> remember what we just said, this shit was just dropped off different places. Bang, all right? So, you was being dropped off 3,000, 300 years, 1,000 years, 1,800 years. So all these could be the same thing. This St. Andrew situation could just be popping off right here in 1152. Possibly. You know what I mean? So we're just digging on it. And of course you got this Cyrus the Great or this Corus or Karush. Alright, that we kept reading about. Corus. Corus. Alright, still got that R-U-S. Still got that Cyrus. Alright. Commonly known as Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Elder by the Greeks. Founded the Achaemenid. Achaemenid. Empire, first Persian Empire. Persia just means land where, all right? Under his rule, the empire embraced all the previous civilized states of the near, ancient Near East, expanding vastly, eventually conquered most of West Asia, Central Asia from the Mid Mediterranean Sea to Hellespont in the West and the Indus River. Cyrus the Great created the largest empire in the world had yet seen under the successors. Remember, the creator was rocking with him. We got that Isaiah. And we got this. Well, this is Isaiah 44, verse 28. It says that, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem that thou be, that thou shall be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. All right. Then you got 45, 1 in Isaiah. Thus said Hawah to his anointed to Cyrus whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loosen the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And the crooked places shall be made straight. All right, so all this has to do with Cyrus the Great, who, you know, got the largest empire the world has ever seen. Hawaii was rocking with him. They also called him the king of the four corners of the world. All right, this has all to do with the Babylonian Empire, but when? Is it in the BCs? Or we're talking about the Babylonian Exilarchs, man. You know what I'm saying? Are we talking Nehemiah, Kalelus? Are we talking the Babylonian Empire, man? 
And all this is still has to do with the Romani and these Hebrews. That's why I can, Kalelu speaks of records of Theodorus, leaders of many people, all right? And he became this exilar, Nehemiah, all right? Theodore, Nehemiah, becomes, so Nehemiah becomes the Western exilar leader of all the Jews of the revived Western Roman Empire, 775. How does this relate to this? In the words of Nehemiah, sons of Hakaliah, and it came to pass. I mean, you know what I mean? So we know that this is Esdras. We know that this is Esdras. We know that this is Nehemiah. And is it also the same Nehemiah, Theodore, or a Mary, Narbon, Makir, Tedros? All right. A Mary, a Mary, a Mary, Theodore. Same name as his pops, right? Same name as his father. We're just talking Nehemiah. We're just talking Nehemiah. And you know, we just even did a little genie search looking for other little Nehemiahs that pop up. This one pops up in 5 or 600 AD, 600 AD. Frederick Nehemiah. You know, all right, all right. So, so, you know, this is a Moshe ben Ashir. Interesting. Moshe ben Nehemiah that pops up in 825. You know what I mean? This one sounds real interesting, man. You know, this is a good little website. You can just dig on these things. We dug on David Slauson like this. Father of Aaron ben Moshe. Aaron, son of Moshe. In 825. 825. What is this? 825. You know, connect with this 775. 825, 775 ain't a big difference. Seem like people are popping up in your timelines, right? Moshe ben Asher ben Moshe ben Nehemiah, son of Nehemiah. So if he's a son of Nehemiah, and he was born in 825, that matches <laughs> quite well with this 775 Nehemiah. If he had a son, you know, he could easily be born in 825. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You never know. He said he died in 865, though. But, you know, again, Dr. Hijack, we're just talking timelines, man. 775 A.D. Nehemiah, Theodore, reconquered American Empire of Kalelus, ruled by Sylvanus to Texas, Solomon the Builder, right? And on and on. Then it goes into the Tuatha de Danins, the Irish legend of Regimon, also alluded to this family. What family? We're just talking about the old gear that they name, Dane, Dane, Tuatha de Danins. We're just talking the all Mac, right? The all Mac. We're just talking the all Mac, all gear, all Mac. We're just talking the all Mac. Just talking the all Mac, man. Ogam, Ogham, Ogear. It's all referring to the all Mac culture of Mexico. Back to the Meshi, Muscovy Meshi. Mexico, Meshi, you know what I'm saying? Let's go. We're just talking the Irish legend of Regimon. So, you know, I just dog on this, man. I just dropped this for y'all. You know, if y'all want to dig further into Regimon, you know, there's a couple little poetic pieces about the raid for the cattle of Regimon. For there, for where there, O oh fair, had knee, a knee, folk now dwell. Can ye plainly see in the lands of Bera, the less, the four, yet called Athcle, Mere, you know, I don't know, man. But they're talking about regiments, troops to fight, to fight. So they're trying to get his troops to fight. This tale, as the Tain Bow, is called Tain Bow, Regamon, is known in the Irish tongue. And this lay, and this lay they make, when the harp they wake, ear the cool coinge. <laughs> Raid be sung, I don't know, man. This is, this is some Irish stuff. Then he got another one called uh, The Driving of the Cattle of uh, Phledius. Phledius. All right, so a lot of this is connected to the Irish, back to this Gaelic situation. A treaty was then made between them on account of this fair man who had carried off the cattle and on account of the fair maidens who had gone with them, by whose means the herd escaped. Restitution of the herd was awarded to Regamon and the maids abode with the sons of Elil and Medib and seven times twenty cows were given up 
and as a dowry for the maidens and for the maintenance of the men of Ireland on occasion of the assembly of Taimbo Kuling, Kuling, so that this tale is called the Taimbo Regamon and is prelude to the tale of Taimbo. All right, all right. Interesting, man. Interesting, man. So you can dig on this cattle situation. There's another uh, translation of it that you can compare. Some more resources, man, for you to dig on. You know what I mean? Go ahead and dig on it. And it's called the Enuma Elise. All right. This is uh, going into the seven tablets of creation. The Enuma Elise. Akkadian cuneiform, also spelled Enuma, Enuma. We're talking the Babylonian creation myth. So since we're talking Babylon, since we're talking Russia, we can get a piece of this for the dismount. Named after the opening words, it is recovered by Austin Henry Layer in 1849 in fragmentary form. It is in the ruined library of Ashburg, Panapal, at Nineveh, Massa, Mosul, Iraq. All right. The form of the myth was first published by George Smith in 1876. After research and further excavations led to the near completion of the text and improved translation, the Enemy Elise has about a thousand lines and is recorded in Old Babylonian on seven clay tablets, each holding between 115 and 170 lines. All right, in Sumero Akkadian cuneiform script. Most of tablet 5 has never been recovered, but aside from this lacuna, this text is almost complete. Okay, okay, so it said tablet 5 is almost complete. Alright, it says this epic is one of the most important sources for understanding the Babylonian worldview over the seven tablets. It describes the creation of the world, a battle between God's focus on supremacy of Murdoch, the creation of man destined for the the service of the Mesopotamian deities and the end of the long passage praising murder and again this goes into uh, a little bit of the Tiamat story which goes into back into the dragon because Tiamat's supposed to be this dragon alright so you know even the beginning of history man starts back and goes back to this dragon and is it a good back dragon or a terrible dragon or X, Y, and Z I mean that's for you to dig on um they say the earth itself is a dragon. It's a living situation. But it all goes back to these tablets. Or even earlier to the time of Hammurabi during the old Babylonian period. So that's another thing to dig on. This is Hammurabi code and all this stuff, which we know already connect to these Israelites, man. So you got this link right here, man. It's a good one, man. Stumbled on it. It's called the Seven Tablets of Creation. You can go right in. You can basically dig on it right away. Let's see if we can get a piece of this right here past this preface. Get the preface, though, so you can get all the drop. You know, it's got the great table of context, man. Got the intro. Skip ahead a little bit. Because the intro is super long. But, you know, it shows you a couple, uh, you know, little diagrams of this text right here. Another uh, cool fragment of it right there. All right, all right. Intro, intro, intro. Longest intro in the game. All right. Bam, the first tap. See what this says right here. Uh huh. We're talking TMI, which means we're talking the dragon, right? It says, When in the height of heaven was not named, the earth beneath did not yet bear a name, and the primeval Apsu, who beget them, and Chaos, TMI, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together. The mother of them both is this dragon that they call TMI, but we also know that this dragon. It's talking about the water. The water is the mem. And what does the mem literally mean? It can mean blood. It can mean chaos. Let's go. Their waters were mingled together and no field was formed. No marsh was to be seen. When the gods, none, 
had been called into being and none bore a name and no destinies were ordained then were created the gods of the midst of heaven Lama la la hama la hamu la ha la mu la ha mu were called into being something something ages increased then Ansar and Pizar were created and over them long were the days men came forth Anu their son Ansar and Anu and the god Anu so a lot is broken off a lot of it's fragmented but you know you can still get a lot out of it man when you want to bring it all back into focus and see what we're dealing with man what are we really dealing with with the seven tablets of creation here's another version of it uh translator lw king you know what i mean you got the same kind of broken off pieces here you know they said uh they said the fifth was the most complete i think so you can dig on that he, Murdoch, made the stations for the great gods, the stars, the images, the stars of the zodiac. He fixed, he ordained the year and into sections. He divided it for the 12 months. He fixed three stars after he had something, the days of the year, something, images. He found the station of Nibir, the planet Jupiter, to determine their bounds, that none might err and go astray. He set the station of Baal and Ea. Along with them, he opened great gates on both sides. He made strong the boat on the left and the right. In the midst thereof, he fixed the zenith, the moon god. He caused to shine forth the night he entrusted to him. He appointed him a being of the night to determine the days. And every month, without seizing with the crown, he covered him, saying, At the beginning of the month, when thou shinest upon the land, thou commands the horns to determine six days, and on the seventh day to divide the crown. On the fourteenth day thou shalt stand opposite the half, when the sun god of the foundations of heaven, something, the, the something that shall cause to, our so it's getting broken up right there. Interesting, man. So, you know, I'm just bringing it to the water, because here's a table of contents you can dig on. Again, we're just talking Cyrus, right? We're talking King of Persia. We're talking Babylon. We're talking the seven tablets of creation, the Babylonian creation story. We're talking Anatoly Fremenko, how this all connects, man. How this all connects with your chronology, man. What does it mean? They're dropping you off, man. Dropping us off, man. Therefore, to us, the current chronology was never truly established. It was based on very subjective methods. So what's the drop? As long as the chronology did not use the methods of mathematics, statistics, and astronomy, the field of history will be subjective and have a very shaky foundation. I think that's what we're talking about. The shaky foundation of his story, man. Of his story. Wow. We're putting it back together, though. We can say that today the project, the new chronology by Fremenko and Nasovsky, consists of two parts. The first part, new mathematical methods for the study of old texts and maps, as well as the first made new chronological map. Is it play play? Let's dig it. Cause ain't nobody else digging on it. The Russians, Babylonia. This map exists on the basis of evaluating ancient historical texts and maps using all the aforementioned methods.
the second part. This is a tentative reconstruction of history based on the new chronological scale. So they start to reconstruct the story based on a new chronological scale. In reconstructing chronology, mathematicians Anatoly Fomenko and Gleb Nasovsky realized that it was necessary to reconstruct world history, man. So when we talk Nehemiah, we're reconstructing the history. When we talk Nehemiah, Nehemiah Theodoric, we're reconstructing history. It has everything to do with the Almec, with the Mexicans. It has everything to do with Drop Nation, man. You know what I'm saying? With everything to do with Reggae Ma. You know what I mean? That's what they say. That's what they say, man. What they say that the Irish legend of Reggae Ma also alludes to this family. And this goes directly into Israel the third, going south to the Toltec lands of Mexico. That's how you know you're just talking about the all Mexica. Ahab to the home team. Man, I mean, Ahab to the real ones, man. Because we are putting it together right in our own backyard. We're digging on it right here. And you're doing it with us, man. I mean, hey. You know, if a jade statue of the Aztec god who was Zilpochichli <laughs> was plundered in Mexico some four to five hundred years ago and placed in the home of an upscale Spaniard, a gift from the New World, a war broke out in Spain and the house was demolished and forgotten in the late 1800s. The ruins of the house were destroyed of the statue found in archaeological excavation. Does this mean that it was now made by the Iberians and should now be